the best way to explain it. Episode 1. way to explain it. I'm one of your hosts, Scott Olson, and with me today is... Brecken Nielsen. Hey. I am here. I am present. Yep. Finally. This is... and finally, we're getting around to recording our inaugural premiere episode of The Best Way to Explain It. It's It's been a journey, man. It has been up to this <laughs> point. So, yeah. we're going to quick talk about what it is this podcast is going to be about. So, the best way to explain, the best way to explain it, would be to say that we're going to take... Boo. Okay, I know that was pretty bad. (laughs) So, we're basically going to take kind of a random niche topic each Monday and Friday and try and explain it to you guys as best as we can. So, these topics are going to be a wide-ranging variety from philosophy to technology to science to books to... Underwater basket weaving, maybe. Okay, mm. I call that episode. Okay, well, we'll see about that. So, <laughs> you know. Do we have to have a challenge to see who wins that one? What? Uh, how, how would we do? How? What sort of challenge is this going to take? The best basket weaved underwater, okay, obviously. So that's how we're going to do it? Yeah. Who can weave the best basket? Underwater. Under Obviously underwater. How else would you I weave mean, a basket? I'm not sure. I've never heard of dry basket weaving before. <laughs> you really don't. That's always the example is underwater. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, geez. Yep. Okay. So, like, if you try and you just, like, don't bring underwater clothes to the class, do they just kick you out and are like, what are you doing? Well, I'm curious because I always hear that it's a major that certain athletes take, like, within football. Yeah. And uh, I'm just curious, like, My major, I had to learn multiple facets within that major to graduate. Mm -hmm. So what what multiple facets are within underwater basket weaving? It seems like it would just be a one-off class. Well, okay, if you think about it this way, you have different sorts of weaves. It's like different kinds of knots that are tied in the Boy Scouts. I imagine there are different types of weaves. So That's true. That's true. Twine, maybe you need a chicken in hand knot or weave. I don't know. I don't know if that's a uh, thing. Yeah, I I feel like you definitely made up that knot. And no, now we have to figure out how to make that knot. I think the fact that I named a different weave means that I get that episode. Okay, all right, fine. You can take that episode. Wow, that this is going to be a good ride. Yeah, yeah. You're just going to get your way, yep. you know? Yeah, pretty much. That's fine with me. Yeah. So, uh, you, anyways, you do all the work and I take all the credit. Well, that's kind of how our whole lives have been. So, yeah, that's that's very true. Yeah. At least the past four years. Yeah, that's that's very true. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> so, Scott, what are we explaining tonight? Well, tonight we're going. To, well, we are. Psh, I did all the work we, for this episode. Uh, I know everything about CPUs, though. Well, oh, oh wow! Just gave it away. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. Bye. Yeah take it oh my gosh no so (laughs) yes as brecken has said i am going to be explaining cpus so what the heck is a cpu how does it work you know the the little inch big chip in your inch big that sounds weird in your computer how the heck does that work and that's what i'm going to tell you guys today (laughs) all right i'm excited to to learn today. Yeah. So before we get started, I want you to know that, well, I don't want you to know. I don't really care if you know this. I want the audience to know that <laughs> I'm going to be going through some kind of specific examples of CPU processing and, you know, kind of how it does that process. And if you get lost, never fear. You can check out our show notes page on the best way to explain it dot com slash one, where it's going to give you all of the examples that I talk about in this episode. So I encourage you to check that out. It's going to be pretty sick. Sounds cool to me. Yeah. 
I didn't even know our URL. Well, I figured that made the most sense. <laughs> yeah, because uh, our podcast is called that. Oh, well, is, is that why I chose that? Is that why we're paying extra money? Oh, it's like of 10 bucks, you doofus. Hey, that's a whole five bucks out of my pocket. Hey, you know, whatever. You know, that's like a beer and a half where I live. Oh my god. It's gosh. National Beer Drinking Day. Is it really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I haven't even had one yet today. What are you thinking? I may need one at the end of this call. <laughs> Probably. Oh jeez. All right. Dealing with me all day. All right. We're gonna get started then. Before before you distract me further, we're gonna get Sorry. started. So CPUs. What the heck is a CPU? Well, CPU literally means core processing unit from the Greek word spu. <laughs> that's that's one of the dumber jokes I've heard, but it made me laugh, so and I'll it, give you credit. It, it fits. It, it fits. Uh, yeah, it, it comes from the time that they they just had, you know, non Texas instrument calculators back in Greece. Yes. Yes. And they had to use non Texas instrument calculators to calculate everything. And how how did they even do that? I I do not know. I don't know That's how ridiculous. I did this. I I don't either. I learned my multiplication tables. But you know where you won't need multiplication tables oh, really? in a CPU. Because oh, okay. a CPU is basically the electronic circuitry within a computer that's going to carry out the construction, the constructions, psh, the instructions of a computer program by performing the basic arithmetic, logical, control, and input-output operations specified by those instructions. So it's going to perform that arithmetic for you. So you don't need to know. Well, you do if you want to do anything interesting with it, but you don't need to know any mathematics. But you're saying it doesn't do anything emotional or anything? No, um, it, it does not. What's, what's the point of that? I don't know. It, it, they're sad and cold pieces of machinery. Very, very depressing CPUs. Very much so. Very, very sad start to our podcast. Yeah, I know. Okay, well, <laughs> I swear this time it's, it's just going to be facts from here on out. No oh. distractions. Oh, fine. For at least the next minute. <laughs> All right, so... How? I give it 30 seconds. Okay. How does a CPU do this? Well, it takes advantage of physics by reducing all computation down to two states, which we usually refer to as yes or no, on or off, one or zero. That That's kind of the general notation that's used throughout computer science and computer engineering. So the reason we use physics is because physics can represent this using electrical charges like zero volts meaning off or five volts meaning on or one or zero or, or whatever particular notation you want to use. So the computer okay. is going to measure this electrical charge to get the on or off value. All right. So in order to kind of understand how the CPU is going to do this, we're going to look at how the CPU is constructed physically. So, each circuit on the CPU is composed of what's called a transistor, or multiple transistors. So, if you ever hear that term, that's what it's referring to. It's these things on the circuits of the CPU. So, the helpful way that I've found to think about these is to think of them like a water pipe from your water company, which is called the source, to your house, which is called the drain. So, you have water coming from a source to a drain with a valve in the middle. So a valve is going to allow water to either flow or not flow, and that's going to represent what's called the gate in the transistor world. Okay? Okay. So you have these three parts within the transistor? Right, that's correct. Cool. And so these transistors are incredibly small. They're microscopic. We fit millions of them on CPUs. So, yes, quite small. But they actually used to be quite large though. So that's that's been a major advance of computation. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah, very much so. So these transistors are made of silicon with electrodes at either end, which, again, are the source and the drain, plus there's this one in the middle, which is the gate. Okay, so that's just silicon at three different locations, basically. And so when a current of electricity is applied to that gate, there's a magnetic field that's produced, which closes the gate, 
And so this state where the gate closed is going to represent off or no or zero. And from now on, I'm just going to call that zero for, for, our, uh, for okay. our purposes. And then when there's no current applied, then the gate is open representing one or yes, right? So if there's no – or if there is electricity applied – then the gate's closed, which means zero. If there isn't, then the gate's open. That means one. So that's basically all of computation can be broken down to that happening. Cool. Which is kind yeah. of mind-blowing if you think about it. Yeah, that's it. really interesting. When I'm uh, researching <laughs> yeah. this, so, this episode, um, like millions of those interactions are going on, aren't there? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's that's crazy. pretty. And because it, because these things move essentially more or less at the speed of light, yeah. I mean not quite, but more or less yeah. there. I mean that's why they can happen so rapidly. So if we have this ability for computers to use these transistors to represent values of zero and one, well, we need better find a way for our information to be represented using zeros and ones. So this is where we get this idea of what's called a binary number. So if you've heard it said that computers are basically zeros and ones, what what we just talked about is what they mean. So now that we have this physical way to represent those two values, we need to figure out how can we represent information kind of abstractly and logically using two values. That way we can perform interesting computation with it. So the zeros and ones provide us with these two values that are sufficient for logical operations because all we need are true and false values for for all logical operations they all just evaluate to either true or false and by the way if you're interested in anything logical you should check out our free logic course at the best way to explain it.com forward slash logic and you will learn a lot about logic and we put that together just for you guys free if you just go to that link so I encourage maybe, you guys to do maybe that. it would make sense to throw in a, a little uh, explanation of what exactly logic is, though. Right now, logic. Yeah. Logic is just a formalization of the way that we as humans reason. So there are things called logical syllogisms, which are ways of us enumerating premises in arguments that lead logically to conclusions. So you use it every day, but you you probably don't think of it as a formal formalized method of of reasoning but but you do, do use it every day and you'll learn more about that in oh, that cool. course and i get no yeah much i was going to say you probably yeah. don't use the word logical syllogisms in your everyday life no i've rarely found the case to do so unless i'm trying to sound really yeah. smart i uh sometimes i just open up the dictionary and i read a word and i i feel like as I build my vocabulary, it helps me to become, you know, more photosynthesis. You. <laughs> it's an oldie but a goodie. Oh it's my an oldie gosh. but a goodie. It, I don't know that it was yeah. ever a goodie. I, I, it's definitely, I an definitely oldie. I definitely liked it, like, back in third grade. Well, are we in third grade? Are uh, we in third sometimes grade? Sometimes my mind goes back to that state. Well, you're the Aww. worst. Thank you. Oh, love you though. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay. So now so, that we've back yeah, on top. now that we've talked <laughs> about like logical operations, like tell us more about how it uh, it works within the computer. So okay, so we have these logical operations. So we can do a lot of reasoning using logical operations, but we also want to be able to do, as we were talking about before mathematical or arithmetic operations, right? How do well how do we do that if the system that of numbers that we have is 10 numbers, not 2, right? Cuz we can represent 2 fine, but we can't represent 10. Well, the way we think about numbers is just one way to represent them. So, we kind of call this normal system the decimal or the base 10 system. This is because there are 10 possible numbers that could be used. Well, we can't represent all 10 numbers very well using physics, but we can represent two numbers, 0 and 1. So this is where the binary numbers come in. So it turns out we can actually represent all numbers using only zeros and ones. This system is called base two for the two numbers. Okay, so think about this. How do we represent the number 125 in decimal? 
Well, we're going to put the 1 in the 100s place on the farthest left, a 2 in the 10s place for uh, in right in the middle, right? And a 5 in the 1s place, which is on the farthest right. I mean, this is obvious because we were taught to do it this way, but it, this is going to be important groundwork. So, consider the name of the number system we were taught. Decimal, like we were taught the decimal system. Well, the, the prefix deci usually refers to the number 10, hence we call this system base 10, as I said before. So if you'll notice that each place in the decimal system has a name that is a multiple of 10, namely 10 times the previous place. So ones, tens, one hundreds, one thousands, etc. Right, so we, we talk about the ones place, the tens place, the you know, and so on. So the number 125 consists of one, one hundred, two tens, and five ones. Or we could write it as 1 times 100 plus 2 times 10 plus 5 times 1, which equals 125. So that that's how, that's the reason 125 is written the way that it is. Is that going to yeah, make sense? Yeah, definitely. So I, I may be advancing it here, but you would kind of have like a, a 1 or a 0 in the twos place and then a one or a zero in the fours place, right? Like kind of, kind of like that. Um, sort of, sort of, sort yeah. of, you're, you're, you're on the, the right track. Okay. So there's one more thing I want to point out about our current system where, before I will contrast it or compare it with the binary system that we have. So if y'all are still following, then you're going to notice that in the ones place, 5 times 1 is the same thing as 5 times 10 to the 0th power, because exponents, anything to the 0th power is equal to 1, so we have 5 times 1. So 10 to the 0 is equal to 1, so anything to the 0 is 1. Okay. So in the tens place, we have 2 times 10 to the first power, which is equivalent to 2 times 10. In our number 125, 2, remember, was in the tens place, so 2 times 10 to the 1 is 2, or uh, 20, I mean. So in the 100s place, we have 1 times 10 to the second power, which is equivalent to 1 times 100. Now, if you'll notice that each of the exponents I mentioned refer to the position each specific numeral takes in the number, assuming we begin with 0 and not 1. And I promise this is going to mean something, and it's going to click soon. So, now that you know how our current number system works, I can then explain binary to you. Now, the reason I went through all this is because binary works the same way. So, if you think about the name base 2, well, if we compose numbers in base 10 using 10 different numerals, 0 through 9, then we will only use two numerals in base 2, 0 and 1. So, how do we compose a number in binary, then? Well, okay, so let's consider the number 125 one more time. Each place in a binary number is going to contain either a 0 or 1. So this is, you were kind of mentioning this yeah. sort of thing. And, and this is where I was saying you were pretty right, <laughs> pretty much right. Uh, this So this 1 or 0 is then multiplied by 2 to some exponent. Because remember, in decimal, we multiplied by 10 to some exponent. But well, in base 2, we're going to multiply by 2 to some exponent. So, uh, instead of taking, you know, 5 times 10 to the 1, we're going to, starting, uh, if we use this new system of binary, we're going to end up with the number 1111101. Okay. Okay? So, since this is an audio podcast, I know it's going to be hard to visualize. So, from left to right, we're going to have five ones, then a 0, and then another 1. So, what do these numbers represent? My bank okay. account. Right. Pretty much. <laughs> yep. Psych. I wish. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty good, yeah. Okay, so we're going to work this one out like our decimal example. So, the one on the farthest to the right. So, the farthest right place. And again, if you guys do want to be following along while I'm doing this example, this example will be on the show notes page at thebestwaytoexplainit.com slash one. And I, I always find doing these conversions is much easier to do when you could see it in front of you rather than just having, you know, some idiot yeah. explain it to you over being, audio. Being an engineer, pictures help. Pictures have always helped. Yeah, yeah that's pretty much all you do is just draw yep. pictures yeah. at work. Well, literally, I look at pictures, and if something doesn't look right, <laughs> I change a number, and then it looks right. <laughs> 
it's not too far <laughs> off. It's it's kind of sad to break my job down that way, but it it works. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. <laughs> okay. So we have the one on the farthest right representing one times two to the zero with power back in our binary example because we're trying to convert 125 to binary. So on the one on the farthest right represents one times two to the zero with power. So this is going to equal one, right? Because two to the zero with power is one, and that's multiplied by one because we have the one in that place. So we get one. So we're going to add this value to the next value to the left, which is zero times two to the first power. Well, anything times zero is zero, so we have one plus zero so far. So next up, we're going to have one times two to the second power. This equals four, so now we have from the left four plus zero plus one. That equals five, right? So then we're going to have another one times two to the third power, which equals eight. So then we get eight plus four plus zero plus one, which is, what is that, 13. And then going another place to the left, we have another one times two to the fourth power. This equals 16, so we have 16 plus eight plus four plus zero plus one which is a number that's higher that I don't really feel like adding up right now. 29. So next. <laughs> right. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. 13 plus 16. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Okay, you can't show me up on my hey, own episode. you're the one doing math by twos. I like to do it by tens. Well, that's and, fair. And that's the fair. computer is that is smarter than me also likes to do it by twos, so I guess I just schooled myself. Well... The reason the computer does it by that by twos is so you don't have to do it's it by tens. Very true. Yeah. Okay. So then we have another one to the times two to the fifth power, which equals thirty-two. So thirty-two plus sixteen plus eight plus four plus zero plus one. And finally, we reach our we're going to reach our last one all the way on the left, which represents one times two to the sixth power, which equals sixty-four. So, in conclusion, we have 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 0 plus 1, which, for the folks keeping track at home, is 125. And, again, I converted that number into decimal, obviously, for ease of translation for our listeners who grew up with the decimal system. Interesting. So that's binary. Wow. Yeah. So that's 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 how your computer understands the number 125 as 1111101 Yeah. 1101. One, one. Yeah. One, one, one. It's totally like a phone yeah. number somewhere. I'm sure it is. I'm going to prank call that. Yeah. I what if you yeah. get charged like $20? Well, what's 20 in binary? Well, let's let's Put it out there. Um, how how about let's not? Let's let's think. Here. I've done enough binary for tonight. So it would be, a reason it would why be we don't sixteen do this plus four. So it would be uh, one zero one zero zero, right? You're Probably. you're really scared now because I might have just nailed that. I I I can't do binary on the. I I need to be paper. <laughs> well, hey, go back through your uh your to your this equals sixteen part, and look at sixteen. So that represents a one. You're not adding eight, so that represents a zero, and then you're adding a four to sixteen, so that represents a. W- you said one zero one yep. zero zero. Okay, then yeah, Nailed I think it. you're right. Proud Thank of you. you. I I, ca- I catch Proud on quick. Dad, right here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not I'm not your dad um, though. You're a little younger. A little Just bit. Just a tad. Yeah. Than you. <laughs> Than me. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So makes makes a difference. So we've learned binary. Right. We learned binary, which is important because that's how computers understand numbers. So you can do this with any number, but it's pretty tedious. So. We just let the computer Unless you're me. It. But we do gain the advantage of a computer being able to understand and do math with these types of numbers. Well, this is extremely powerful for us. So now that we have this idea of how data is being stored and processed as a sequence of ones and zeros, we can kind of proceed in terms of how the computer does processing with it. 
Well, the computer scientists that be that just designed these things, they took to calling a zero or one value, one number in the sequence, a bit. So in our 125 example, the 1111-1101, each one or zero is called a bit. So as we've seen, though, one bit on its own isn't going to convey much data because, you know, it, it can only represent two values. So the computer scientists that be decided to group eight of these bits together to be called a byte. Wait. Okay. So this is where the terms megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte, yottabyte. I don't know <laughs> if anybody uses yottabyte, but that is a Wait, thing. Wait, you, you don't have like five yottabyte uh, sticks at home just to carry around? Um, no, I I do not have a yacht wow. of sticks at home. What a what a amateur. <laughs> hey, you got the uh photosynthesis yeah, test that's earlier. True. That's true. <laughs> I think I'm allowed <laughs> yacht of sticks. <laughs> well, uh, so not only did these guys think like, hey, let's make computers think by zeros and ones, but then they said let's describe all these zeros and ones by groups of eight. Yeah. Right. So they know a lot I of have math. Have to look up but, why exactly that but is. But it seems like these guys just kind of want to confuse people. I don't. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure why eight was chosen. Because so, that's the the most you can represent in terms of one yeah. byte is what 255. Uh. That's that's the highest value. If like if, if you just had four or eight ones. Yeah. I. No. Now there are reasons within computers why you know why you represent that i mean there's we represent 255 characters in a certain character yeah. set but i don't know why that was chosen you know from the yeah beginning. It, it just seems in- interesting to me so yeah yeah no i i agree i'll have to look that up sometime so basically what this whole byte thing means is that a 500 gigabyte hard drive means that the hard drive can store four times ten to the twelfth power zeros and okay. ones which is a lot of zeros and ones. So, though not so much anymore because we process so much data now. But, yeah. True. So, now that we know what a CPU is composed of and how it represents data, let's look at what one consists of in terms of its actual computational ability. So, I think you guys are ready for that, and we're going to get started. So there's two basic parts to the CPU, the control unit and the arithmetic logic unit. So the control unit contains the circuitry that uses electricity to direct the computer to execute stored program instructions that are stored in RAM or random access memory is what that's called. So basically this this whole fancy terminology that I just use just tells the different parts of the CPU what to do. The control unit is just going to be be that watchful eye that says we need to do this action now or we need to do these actions simultaneously so that's kind of what the control unit does the ALU then which is what the 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 arithmetic logic unit is usually abbreviated as ALU so that's what I'm going to be using it as so the ALU performs the you guessed it, arithmetic and logic operations the CPU needs to execute instructions. All right, so I find it more helpful to start with the ALU because I think it makes more sense to explain the control unit after we know the ALU, what the ALU does because the control unit kind of controls the ALU. So you kind of have to know what the ALU does so you, in order to know why the control unit needs to control it. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do. And also, this is my show. <laughs> I do what I want. I guess you can take over. Yeah. So, the ALU is part of the CPU that, when given values, can perform logical and mathematical operations on those values, and it'll return or output a value. So, what sorts of operations do these logical and mathematical operations consist of? Well, the ALU can be given values, and keep in mind these values are just ones and zeros, and it'll add them or subtract them. Well, 
adding and subtracting ones and zeros isn't very a very useful or I interesting task if we can't compose the values into many ones and zeros or the bytes that we talked about. So so it it has a way of composing them together basically. Okay. Or yeah. the the hard drive does yeah. or whatever. That's how they're stored together. So, but not only can it add or subtract the values, but it can do these operations called logical and or nor xor xnor not compare etc um, though these are these specific actions are subject to change based on the processor that you're using some processors can do more some can do less you know it, it just depends on who's creating so it. so other than and or some of those maybe sounded like lord of the rings names to you um, right. Yep. So basically like, and, or you've probably used them in Excel unless you're young and don't use Excel, in which case learn how to. What the heck Yeah, is yeah what is that? <laughs> but then, uh, like nor and XOR. No, that's actually a good point. That's a good yeah, way to learn. Yeah. But like nor, XOR, so, and XNOR, like. Oh shoot. What they, is nor? It, it's oh. not this or this, right? Kind of. I so nor nor I believe is just not okay. or. So you take the result of an or operation and then you just flip whatever result that is. So if an or operation results in a true value, then it's false. Okay. Vice okay. versa. X or is the exclusive or. Okay. So that means that if you so given an or function, an or function is true if either one of the input values is true or if both of them are true well xor is only true if only one of them is okay. true so they can't both be true if they're both true then it's false so that's the xor and then similarly with the xnor yeah. it's just the exclusive nor and then not just flips the value okay that's a unary cool. operator. so so yeah so and then compare can compare whether or not a value is bigger or smaller cool like it can compare like bytes. It compares like large chunks of values. Cool. So, yeah. That's basically what those operations are. And again, I talked briefly about those in the logic course at the best way to explain it dot com slash logic. So if you're interested, you can check that <laughs> out and you'll be able to learn there. So how does the ALU work? Well, it's actually part of a larger segment of the CPU called the data path. So the data path consists of the bank of registers, which hold individual values or zeros and ones, and the ALU itself. So these registers also contain some values that help to control how the data is read. So these values are things like the clock, which is used for data storage, a read-write bit, which is going to tell the register whether or not we are reading data from it or writing data to it. So reading means we're figuring out what value is stored at a specific location, and writing data to it means we're storing a value there. Um, oh, it also tells the addresses of the registers that could be read, or what's accessible to be computed, and the actual data itself. So the ALU is going to take in two values from this bank of registers that we have, as well as another value which represents the op, or the operator, and it's going to tell the ALU what sort of operation to perform like an and or an or or an add or subtract or something like that. So the result of this computation is stored in a result register. So this register will usually do a few things. So some computations allow the result of the computation to be used as input into another computation, thus allowing the stringing together of multiple computations to do more interesting stuff. And other values are just merely written back into the bank of registers to be stored for later use, perhaps by another part of the computer. So how does the CPU decide which values should be input into the ALU for computation? Well, for this task, it's going to use what are called multiplexers. So multiplexers are objects that sort of make the decisions about which values should be read into the ALU. So how do they do this? Well, they do it using logical operations on values. So they're constructed in such a way that if given a certain electrical signal or a group of signals, and remember these signals are just representing our ones and zeros, they're going to they're input the correct value into the ALU that represents what our desired computation is or what the CPU's desired computation is. And so this was essentially what the ALU does in the CPU. And I kind of hope this makes sense. 
it's much easier to explain if you can draw a diagram of you know where the inputs are going into but that's that's probably the best way I could explain it just using my words and since that is <laughs> the point of this podcast I feel like I've done yeah. a good job anyways now that we've talked about the ALU we're going to briefly discuss the control unit so if you remember when I talked about the control signals that are held in the registers, these are things like the clock, the read-write bit, the addre- addresses of the available registers, the operator to be used, that stuff. Well, the control unit is in charge of making sure that these values are input correctly and at appropriate times. So this is why I said I think it's easier to explain the ALU first because those things wouldn't mean much to people if you didn't know what the ALU was actually doing with them. And so the control unit is just in charge of figuring that stuff out. Makes sense. Well, how does this control unit know what to do? Well, this information is stored in the instruction register. So this register is going to contain a value which holds information about the steps required to perform the desired operation. So the control unit has to then decode, which is, this word decode is different than the word decrypt, which you might you might similarly associate those two words, but they're different. Decryption has more to do with security and obscuring the meaning of something. Decoding is just changing from one format to another. So when we changed from when we changed the number 125 from decimal to binary, you could say we decoded the binary, the decimal into binary. So that's what that word means. Um, so the control unit has to decode the instructions and the steps in order to properly tell the ALU what to do. Well, where do these instructions come from? Well, programs. So if you, you ever hear that I'm writing a program, what you're, what you're hearing somebody tell you is I am writing instructions for the CPU about what to do. So computer programmers essentially tell the CPU what sort of instructions they want to be performed. And over time, we, what we've done is we've abstracted this process out from having to tediously use ones and zeros, and now we can use what are called programming languages, which are then translated by the computer into a language it can understand, namely the binary values. So these programs are stored in memory, where the CPU is going to read from uh, read from that memory in order to take it as an input to the instruction register. Okay. So that's what programming is at its bare basics. <laughs> at the uh at the little keyboard that just has a one zero and an enter button. Yeah. Right. No. <laughs> I no computer programmer does yeah. that anymore. Nobody really does that anymore. Some computer engineers probably do that, but very they're few. the crazy people in Wyoming in a cabin like trying to program their recreational nukes or something. Right? I can neither confirm nor deny that. <laughs> I knew it. I knew that cabin that you own. It was up to something different. Yep, yep. I'm trying to nuke the world. He, You heard it here on the first episode. <laughs> yeah, I, I know you've been suspicious of me for yeah, a while. Yeah, you always kind of leave the party early is, is the deal. And then... Well, that's just because I'm going to go nuke yeah, people. okay. NSA, I do not know this man. <laughs> uh, do you think the NSA listens to podcasts for nukes? No, they just listen to you when you're not podcasting. When you're podcasting, no, they know it's a They're probably joke. listening now. Yeah. 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 I, you know, do your worst. <laughs> You'll, okay. They'll find out how pure of a, a altar boy you are. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's cool. Okay. There's one more thing I need to talk about before I'm kind of done explaining CPUs, and that is how does the CPU, CPU, oh, excuse me, how does the CPU know where to look in memory for the specific program it needs to execute? Well, obviously there's going to be multiple programs the machine is going to need to run in a specific order because not all of your applications you use run at the same time, right? So the CPU needs to know where to look in memory for the desired program. Well, the solution we devised for this is what's known as the PC. This is not I'm not referring to the personal computer, what you're probably typing on, or, or whatever you do, do your computation on. Whatever you send your emails and look at the AOL homepage on. That's not what I'm referring to. Wait, so to. you're not recording this on a tablet? 
No, I'm not Weird. actually. Maybe mm. I should upgrade. Yeah. Yep. I'm I'm recording this on my IBM wow. computer. No. I'm I'm not. Well, technically I mean <laughs> Windows was IBM. Was. At some point. So Yeah. 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 Okay, so the PC is going to store the memory addresses in ones and zeros of the desired program to be executed. So it's then going to tell the instruction register where to look in memory for the steps for the program to be executed. And this process can be repeated as long as there are programs in memory that need to be executed. And yeah, that's in a very high-level way the best way to explain CPUs. I do want to make a disclaimer that if I butchered something... Which, I mean, <laughs> unlikely, <laughs> but it may oh. happen. I have been oh. known one time to make a mistake. Yeah. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> but the if I happen to make a mistake, I'm sorry. I was trying to abstract this as much as possible. And I, I do have a, or I'm getting a degree in computer science, so I have some semblance of expertise. And I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express, so. Holy Moses. That. <laughs> have you ever my dad always makes that joke. <laughs> that's did you ever yeah, watch that yeah. I, commercial that commercial is hey it was a classic because it was like oh i stayed at the holiday Inn express and then there's a holiday Inn express that is where i live and i'm like yeah it's just another hotel <laughs> but apparently you gain all sorts of expertise I, staying i, I there. think they have a like in the nightstand, they have a Bible, but then they also have a physics te- textbook right next to it, <laughs> just in case. So basically what you're saying is they're the perfect sponsor for this yeah, podcast. Yeah, it, Holiday Inn Express, if you're listening, you can give us all the money you want, and we will talk about you. Yeah, We will be the exclusive <laughs> sponsor, or exclusive I, advertiser of... Holiday we might Express. be the first to break Holiday Inn Express into the podcast atmosphere. That would be that would be you, amazing. You heard it here first, folks. Uh, Holiday Inn Express, stay there, be smart, look good. Also, I just made that up. <laughs> what was that? Uh, was that like a commercial for something? I'm I'm not sure. Was it it's some? I don't know. Razor Company or I don't know Joseph A Bank. No, Joseph right. A Bank is no. That's like that's Men's Warehouse. Look. No, Men's Warehouse. Which one's is, that? You're gonna like the way you look. Men's Warehouse. Joseph A Bank is. You'll spend a little bit more it. per suit, but you'll also get three in a deal. Versus, you know, Men's Warehouse. That's not their official slogan for Joseph A Bank. No, I'm pretty sure Joseph A. Bank is, I didn't want to go to J.C. Penney's without my Ooh. wife. Okay. Hey, Joseph, yeah, just Joseph A. That's Bank will from. burn you for money, too, if you want to give us some money. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We we are complete sellouts we on are. this podcast. Just straight up. like We're, we're just... We, we, we could pretend to have principles, but honestly, we're just yeah, sellouts. Yeah, just give us money. Uh, luckily... This isn't a video podcast, so we won't get naked or anything, but yeah. No, and probably not even on a video yeah, podcast. Yeah, well, speak for yourself. Well, <laughs> you're naked now, probably. Uh, no, no. It's too cold in my air-conditioned oh, household oh. of 72 ah. degrees. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> this this went off the deep end. Well, this is kind of <laughs> degraded pretty quickly. I'm uh, I'm glad we learned about CPUs and talked about getting naked all on the first episode. Also, recreational <laughs> nukes know, these got are in there. Guarantees, you know, nukes, CPUs, and nudity. Yeah. Oh, there needs to be an n an n word for CPUs. Well, let's not nukes, nudes, and <laughs> let's not use the phrase n word. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Oh my god! Someone sees pictures of us, and they might think we mean something else. <laughs> okay. Well, full disclaimer: 
I'm not yeah. a racist. Full full and disclaimer. This probably I'm needs to end either. And yeah, let's end this before it goes even further. This probably further needs off to deep end before something's bad. All right, check it out. The best way to explain it.com. We'll see you next time. Get learning.